Thank you for that reflection, Bill. And indeed, it is on the, uh, on the theme of a warning, but take heart, that uh, we enter into this uh, section of Scripture today, because we see a continued testimony of the way God is doing or this rescue plan that we made reference to at the very beginning of the story, but doing it through these imperfect humans. Let us remind ourselves a little bit of where we've come so far. We started this story through the great Bible adventure, the summer Bible adventure, uh, by sin separating us from God. But then God initiated a rescue plan, but through imperfect people. Now, these imperfect people were put into slavery and, but were, and were demonstrated God's saving power through being brought out of Egypt, but of course were shown that were given this template for a relationship with God. God was faithful. And indeed, even in, with imperfect people, there's this warning, but that, as Bill said, we take heart because God is the one initiating this rescue plan and this relationship. Unfortunately, just, uh, you know, not very long after this relationship was started, Israel was the one that wandered away. The first generation wandered away, so God waited for the next. But God did, was, though, faithful and bring them into the promised land, as he did through, through Joshua. But then, of course, the, the Israel continued to fail in following him, through the, following him through the period of the judges. And yet, the more the Israel failed, the more God rescued them. But indeed, we found ourselves at the end of Judges, this very difficult part of Scripture, with indeed more rescue being needed, because it seems like these Israelites were, were not quite getting it. And I don't just simply blame the Israelites. Isn't this kind of our story in so many ways and so many seasons? Have we not also faced struggles or times in our life where we have continually cycled through that sin, faithfulness, sin, faithfulness, we keep on going it seems down and down and down, and we wonder, where is our help? Where is our rescue going to come from? Well, one of the things we often do is say, I know what's going to, what we can do. This is going to be my, my route towards salvation. I am going to find my way to God through this. And we take pride in the, in the methods that we have come up with. And what's interesting about the way God works is on the one hand, he offers a warning but in another hand, we always take heart. Just as uh, Bill described, we find ourselves at the beginning of the story of the unified kingdom, not actually in the unified kingdom at all. In the beginning of 1 Samuel chapters 1 to 7, we find ourselves still actually in the period of Judges. We have the story of Samuel. Uh, many of us know the story where he goes to Eli, he hears, this, he hears a sound, he goes, I'm here, I'm, I'm here. And Eli says, well, I didn't say anything. And he says, go and say, speak, Lord, I am listening. And he says, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And, of course, he gets a call to be a prophet, a, a the final judge for Israel. But as Bill pointed out, it didn't work out very well for, for his sons. Because, of course, even though Samuel was the last great judge, his sons were not doing so well at it. And at this point in the story, Israel was kind of noticing it. They, at the very least, you can give them credit for the fact that they're noticing that this pattern of unfaithfulness is continuing on, and that even though Samuel was a great judge, his, his sons were not taking Israel in the right direction. So in a moment of sort of somewhat clarity, just like where we do sometimes, we say, you know what, I've been following God, but this is the way it's going to work. Israel cries out to Samuel for a particular thing, as Bill referenced, and we're going to read that passage of Scripture today and see what it is that they requested of God. So we're going to turn, if you have your, if you have your Bibles, and there's Bibles in the back that you can borrow as well if you'd like to follow along, but we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we're going to start from the very, very beginning. 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting from verse 1. We'll put it up on the slide as well. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Not good guys. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and, sa and came, to Samuel at came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Do now appoint a king to lead us, as such as all the other nations have. 
Appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. They, want, they figured their salvation would be found in having a ruler just like the other nations. Well, they're all controlled and together, and they have things together, and they're powerful and mighty. We want to be powerful and mighty for God. We want to follow God, so we want to do it the way the nations are doing it. Bill only made reference, already made reference to what, how the story continues, but let's continue on and see what God has to say about this. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. There's a there's a phrase that happened that I didn't make reference to this last time in Judges, but there's a phrase that gets repeated at the end of the, uh, at the, near the end of Judges. It's repeated four times, not in succession, in four different parts. It's this phrase that says, in those days Israel had no king, no king, not not king. In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. It's kind of an ironic uh, refrain at the, at, at, in Judges because the author of the Judges is sort of putting at the feet of kinglessness the fact that Israel is going wayward in their ways for the Lord. And so it, there is this, it's inaccurately depicting this sort of desire that's just started welling up into people to have an earthly king. But here God hears what they said and, and, and God in his wisdom noted that it wasn't actually... An earthly king they wanted. What they wanted was what they wanted was at the the actual king, the actual king of this earth, the actual king of this land, God. The the, the desire was, was was true. They want someone to be able to guide them into the ways of God and to keep them on the straight and narrow. But they assumed that would happen through this otherworldly wisdom. Except what God says, I've been here the entire time. And so while this is clearly full of, uh, rife with problems to go offer worldly wisdom, God does this in a turn that is very fascinating to me. And, and, and it's almost kind of like if I were God, I would do it so much different. Which is, of course, perhaps not m me not accepting him as king as well. But what does God say in 1 Samuel 8, 9? He says, now listen to them. Don't reject them. Don't tell them it's a bad idea. Listen to them, Samuel, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign, what, what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And so what is fascinating to me is God allows it. God allows it. He doesn't say, no, I'm going to cut you off. No, I'm going to let another nation to invade you. I'm going to lift my hand from you. Even this worldly wisdom that is going to be rife with problems, and God even says, warn them what's going to happen, God allows it. And so the passage continues. I don't have it on the slides, but I'll read it here for you. It's kind of a laundry list of things you don't want someone to do for you. Uh, and Samuel says this on behalf of God to the people. He says, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of the chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and all of groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and your female servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. <clears throat> and in this is, for me, one of the most fascinating features of about God and this Bible adventure, which in a way we are still on. We are still on God's adventure in God's rescue plan. 
the rescue plan has come to, to culmination in Jesus. And yet there is still a complete fulfillment that we all yet await. And even while it does that, I think God is continuing to do the very thing that you, I think, can make, take test, make testimony of in your life. You can probably look back in your life and say, man, that thing that I was doing was, was totally not the right thing. And yet God showed his grace and provision even in my poor decisions. Even in the thing that I was doing that was accepting worldly wisdom to fix my lot in life through one thing or another, God was still there. See, if I was God, I would just kind of control everybody. You know, I just, uh, you know, I, just like many of us, suffer from that control freakness, you know, just like, any, I think just like many of us, we like to control our little domain, make sure everything is in our grasp, make sure nothing, everything is expected and everything is going according to plan, my plan, of course. But of course, I'm not God, and thank goodness, because God shows godly wisdom in showing that he takes on the power and shoulders the burden of forming his people. He takes sole responsibility for being the one to say, I am going to take these people and I am going to, you, I'm going to direct you to the promised land, kicking and screaming whether you like it or not. The wisdom for us today is to remember something that Bill indeed was also uh, uh, sharing with us. That our hope, that, that, that there's many things that we might see around us to, and, and we might desire to save ourselves and our world from one lot or, and life or another. And I'm not about to say that um, being involved in politics isn't a good thing. Sure, politics is, I, I say, you know, being attended, attentive to what our nation is doing and be attentive in that sense is definitely a good thing. Doing some sort of uh, work for social justice in the world is absolutely good and positive and is, is great. But none of these things will save us ultimately. These are at best secondary or tertiary things that we can do in communion with God. But if God isn't at the center of what we are doing, there's no earthly power that is going to save us. From all intents and purposes, it looked like the king's strategy was going to work out. Every other nation that's invading us has a king. That's the thing that we're going to do to save us and be powerful. So what we are going to do, we're going to apply the worldly wisdom to save our world from all the ills of society. We're going to make sure that everybody is right and just through all this uh, social activism and work. Not that they are bad things, because indeed, God did indeed use a king as well. He still uses the things that we do in this world. So go indeed and be involved in the world, involved politically, involved socially, involved in your community. These are all good things, but, for, but these alone will not rescue us from our ills. The hope of the world, the hope for us, is our King Jesus. There is no pastor that's going to save you. There is no spiritual leader that's going to save you. There's no sermon that's going to save you. If, if I can, I'm not asking you here to follow me, follow my interpretation, follow my way of thinking. I'm asking you to turn your gaze to our King. If I can do anything through this pulpit, if I can do anything through this, through my ministry, it's to help us direct our gaze to him. I am going to say some things. About 60% of it will be correct. I don't know which 60%. No, thank you for laughing somebody. That was fun. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how much of it is correct. But indeed, I wish for you to bring your gaze to God as we do this together. And so... What we see is the grace of God even in these decisions. Yes, so we know this, many of us know the story of the unified kingdom. There was Saul, and then there was David, and there was Solomon. And we know, particularly David, he was a great king, and indeed he was, he was through the very passage we stated. I'm not going to read it again. We had it beautifully illustrated up here. God promised to make his, 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 his covenant with the world, his fulfillment, come through David and through his nations. He did utilize the kings for his for his will, but they were not perfect. David, of course, uh, was unfaithful and caused another man to die because of his unfaithfulness and wasn't there to uh, protect his daughter from, uh, from, from ill treatment from his own sons when the time when was needed and didn't enact justice in the way that he should. These were flawed people, and we are flawed people. But we should take our example from him is that every time he turned back to God, indeed, the theme for today is that even though Israel asked for a king, God provided, with, God provided with a warning and a promise. And the same promise exists for us today. 
Though we may decide even now, even later, to utilize worldly wisdom in our sinfulness, in our waywardness, God is still going to be with us. And so I invite us as we continue to go on this Bible adventure of our own, as we go through our life and our adventure with God, that we take as an example uh, someone who I think is, is, is a pillar of, of faith for us to model ourselves after, and it's someone that comes from this exact section of Scripture, and it is Samuel's mother, Hannah. Hannah, don't be like me. Don't be like... David, if anything, be like Hannah. <laughs> we know how the many of us may know how the begin, how, how the story begins. Uh, there was a man who had two wives. One of them was named ha- Hannah. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and, Phine- uh, where Hophni and Phineas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the dame came for Elkanah's sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Pen and I, and to all their sons and daughters. But Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she kept wept and would not eat. Once then, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. She was praying so fervently that she was accused of being drunk. She was putting herself completely at the mercy of the Lord in a time where everything she needed, because she could use her worldly wisdom to go into bitterness or go into rage against her, her, against her, against his, her husband's other wife. She, she could have done all those things. And yet what she did is she turned to the Lord and she prayed and she prayed and she wept and she prayed. May we do the same. May we simply follow the example of Hannah, and as we are walking our way of life, let us turn away from worldly wisdom, get on our knees before God, and ask for him to direct our gaze so that we might live in righteousness with him. Amen.